Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all joining us from across the world. Welcome to the Parliament of the World's Religions Next Gen Task Force webinar on building forward equal for peace, freedom, and democracy to commemorate International Day of Democracy and International Day of Peace. My name is Kehkesha. I'm the youngest trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions and the chair of its Next Gen Task Force and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. It has been more than a year and a half since the pandemic hit us, catching us completely unawares, and even the wealthiest and mighty uh, of nations are included in this. The vaccine rollouts that promise to alleviate the pain and suffering and restore norm normalcy have done that, but only in developed nations and within them in affluent segments. And while the impacts of the pandemic were disproportionately severe on the weak and the vulnerable, the vaccine rollouts continue in the same blatant vein. Thousands of doses being trashed as they cross the expiry date, while millions in the global south remain in elusive search of the first dose. We have also seen an unfortunate shift to autocratic regimes and the rise of hate in many parts of the world that, coupled with the pandemic, is causing a severe regression of peace, freedom, and democracy and our basic human rights. It is these deep-seated inequalities that must be identified and addressed as the process of rebuilding better unfolds. What must we do as civil society actors, as young people, to ensure that we don't carry forward these endemic fallacies into the next era? It's not going to be easy, but then again, change never is. And we're delighted to have with us today an eminent panel of young thought leaders to share their insights on how we can address and mitigate these challenges and pave the way for an equitable future for people and planet. With that, I'd like to invite our first panelist, Sara Rahim, International Program Manager at ACWAY. Sara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gekhashan. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sara Rahim, and I'm the International Program Manager at ACWE, also known as a common word among the youth. Um, thank you so much, Next Gen Task Force, for having us in this discussion. I'm really excited to kind of explore this theme of peace and freedom and democracy um, and just rebuilding for over the next hour. So I'm actually currently calling in from Italy, where I have spent the past few days meeting with policymakers, religious officials, and civil society leaders um, as part of the G20 Interfaith Forum, which is really a space that brings both faith and policy together. So I will be speaking more to um, this discussion from both a grassroots interfaith leader perspective and also a high-level policy perspective. Um, I'm also excited to be representing my youth organization called ACWAY, A Common Word Among the Youth, we are a youth-led, youth-driven interfaith movement, and our organization contains over 200 young people from over 85 countries, and we're committed to making interfaith cooperation a norm through action, right? So being able to translate dialogue to action. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just sharing more about how young people have been impacted by COVID-19, and then opportunities for support and collaboration, right? So if we take a second and zoom out, I think we can all agree that these past 16 months have been unprecedented times, right? COVID-19 has really challenged us to think about how we are defining religious freedom or the lack thereof, right? So the questions that come to me a year and a half after a lockdown or multiple lockdowns is, how do you strike this balance between protecting public health during a global pandemic but also respecting civil liberties, right? Like including the free exercise of religion. You know, we're seeing that people are unable to move freely and convene with the spaces in which they define as community, right? So for me as a young person, I identify as a Pakistani American Muslim woman. And my, my spaces of physical community included university, included work, included my mosque. And what does it mean now, especially when you think about freedom, when you are unable to access that community, right? So there's really two thoughts that come to mind that I'm gonna challenge all of us to think about for ourselves and our community is A, just how do you personally define community, right? Can you access that in a physical way? Can you access that in a virtual way? 
And my second question for all of us when we think about rebuilding is, how do you define digital equity, right? When it comes to accessing your faith community or services that might be offered by your house of worship, right? What does it mean for me as a Muslim American when I could no longer physically convene in a mosque and luckily was able to have Facebook access, you know, live streaming? Uh, what does it mean when you can't do that and you are kind of stuck in your space? So zooming out a little bit, um, I'm gonna set the stage for, uh, you know, the policy space. We often think about the UN SDGs, right? What does it mean when the UN Sustainable Development Agenda is addressing a lot of these inequities we talk about from a preset space? So since the adoption of the UN SDGs, um, our global community has been committed to helping young people, right? Really achieve those inclusive, sustainable, and stable societies. And I'm gonna challenge that from a perspective of a COVID-19 response, right? So when we think of combating the threats of climate change, economic instability, poverty, conflict and migration, I think something we have to acknowledge is that um, the pandemic has made it much harder to be able to like achieve that work. And uh, we can no longer ignore the role of young people and also the role that young people play in shaping religious and cultural communities, right? So today our global community contains over 1.2 billion young people aged 15 to 24, and they make up over 16% of the global population. But challenges still remain when it comes to access to education, right? So um, recently we, we did a study in which we learned that um, upper secondary enrollment rates averaged only 14% in low income countries, acknowledging that a lot of our young people from Akwe communities are what certain folks call the global south. So how can we play a role in helping continue to mitigate those barriers and promote access for folks? Um, again, the COVID-19 pandemic has widened these gaps even more, right? And they've really unmasked additional forms of exclusion that marginalize children, women, and youth. So according to the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth, over 73% of those surveyed experienced school closures and all were not able to transition into online and distance learning, right? So again, thinking about what does community mean and what does it mean to have access or lack of access to the digital space? COVID-19 has also left one in eight young people without any access to courses, teaching, or training, a situation that, again, highlights the digital divide between regions. So um, recently in dialogue at the G20, I brought up the access to stable employment as a challenge that young people are also facing, right? So the pandemic has destroyed employment opportunities on young workers, with one in six young people who were employed before the outbreak now stopping work altogether. We've also learned that two out of five young people reported a reduction in their income, and that young people in lower income countries are the most exposed to reduction in working hours. So young people also reported an indirect impact on their freedom of movement, right? So one in three noticed an impact on their right to participate in public affairs. And over a quarter experienced difficulties in exercising their right to freedom of religion or belief. And this is where I think this dialogue and our work is so important, right? Thinking about, again, what are we doing to help promote, create those spaces when young people cannot access them? And how do we help rebuild that? So, you know, oftentimes ignorance about the religious other has further increased um, during this climate of fear and intolerance. Um, but despite these challenges, I think young people are remaining committed to stepping up and partnering, right, to kind of safely and effectively work with civil society, social partners, and government institutions. So on, on the flip side, after we did a survey of our community, we learned that one in four young people reported actively engaging in volunteerism and in making donations towards COVID-19 response efforts. So that's really where I see an opportunity for us to rebuild, right? Young people went on to call governments to continue enforcing containment measures, working from home whenever possible. So to this degree, my recommendation to the actual G20 interfaith space, and as well as to our global institutions on this call right now, is um, actually the incorporation of what I define as the interfaith development goals the IDGs, which were drafted by an organization called ACWE. So the Interfaith Development Goals are kind of intended to complement the SDGs, right? Where we, the young people at ACWE saw a gap. They were developed to capture and demonstrate really how religious faith and spiritual communities can really contribute to building peace and harmony from a quantitative metric, right? They were developed over two and a half years um, by young people with support from senior leaders. So uh, we have a series of IDGs that I'm happy to share after this call guy email, but I'm going to highlight two IDGs for us. The first is IDG goal four, which is intergenerational engagement. We define this as encouraging and promoting young people to take an active role in their faith communities and civil society 
in order to foster cross-cultural understanding in a sustainable way, right? So again, promoting this idea that the digital divide has further created barriers for young people to access spaces where they can voice their values and put that into action. So it's now more than ever evident to institutionalize this space in which we're engaging young people from a grassroots perspective, building their voices in and ensuring that they're able to help shape the future of our communities. Um, I would also like to highlight IDG goal six, which is access to interfaith education and religious literacy, right? So at both a national and international level, we must continue to encourage dialogue and inclusive education across faith and culture, especially during a time in which fear and misunderstanding is rampant, right? Um, so in order to have successful dialogue, we have to create virtual education and interfaith pathways that really promote exposure and knowledge of the religious other. So if there was one takeaway I had for all of you today, it's really that staying connected in a time of disconnect and uncertainty is crucial, right? So to conclude my kind of remarks, it's really that after this week in Italy, you know, discussing um, the most pressing challenges that young people face across the world and figuring out how do we translate that into actionable policy recommendations, I learned that, um, you know, it's often common for policy and faith leaders to make recommendations to address the issues that young people encounter, right, based on their knowledge. But the ask that I have of you all is how effective can implementation be without having young people as part of the decision making process, right? So the biggest recommendations that I can offer, especially in the context of COVID-19, is to develop policies that protect, integrate, and develop young people, right? So this includes urgent and targeted investment in decent jobs for youth, employment and job training programs. I come from a workforce development space, which is something I'm very passionate about. Social protection, strong mental health resources, um, as well as greater efforts to really boost the quality and delivery of online distance learning. And finally, we need to continue to invest in programs and partnerships that combat the threats of climate change. So after spending the past few days with young people really brainstorming on what issues impact our community and bringing these policy issues to our global leaders in actionable bite-sized solutions, um, I'm just gonna put out another call to action for you know, challenging our community and our official leaders as well to really focus their attention on children and youth really translating those policies in perspective, right? So we do believe that youth participation in local faith communities can yield more sustainable and intergenerational impact. And frankly, I see that as a result of all of us on this call today, right? I believe that we are young people who are passionate about issues impacting our community, and we are working to build dialogue and really translate that into practicable change. So um, thank you again for you know having me in this space, and I'm excited to learn alongside my panelists as well. Thank you very much, Sarah, for speaking to us about the importance of, uh, well, the interfaith development goals. I think we particularly like the one on intergenerational solidarity because that is something that we also propagate here at the Next Gen Task Force. And of course, the pandemic has widened the opportunity gap and has it had a disproportionate impact on young people, women, and yes, young people. We have to be a part of the decision-making process and, you know, we need to be recognized as human beings with experience and expertise and not just people who are defined by our age. So thank you very much for speaking about that. And of course, for the importance of interface harmony. Uh, with that, I invite our next panelist, Anshita Hegde, Chapter Head of Green Hope Foundation India. Anshita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kaksha. I'm honored to be part of this panel to discuss such an important topic. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced nations to review their policies and systems. Countries that believed they had strong foundations were exposed to the glaring inconsistency and effects of their infrastructures. While developing countries were pushed further behind in their process of achieving progress. Loss of jobs, increased class inequalities and acute shortages of resources have largely undone all progress achieved since the adoption of the SDGs. As we slowly recover from the pandemic, there is no option other than rebuilding inclusively and sustainably. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a dramatic loss of human life worldwide. It poses a challenge to public health, education, food systems, and the world of work. 
the economic and social disruption caused by the pandemic is very devastating with tens of millions of people at risk of falling into extreme poverty. Nearly half of the world's workforce are at risk from the slowdown. Informal economy workers are particularly vulnerable because the majority lack social protection and access to quality healthcare. As breadwinners lose jobs, fall ill and die, the food security and nutrition of millions are under threat with those in low income countries, particularly the most marginalized population being hardest hit. As a grassroots civil society activist working on the localization of the sustainable development goals, I am deeply disappointed that these infrastructural and constitutional defects were being highlighted year after year at multiple forums with the consequences clearly stated, but yet they weren't addressed on the ground. Why didn't countries around the world show more intent in building a better and well-equipped mechanisms of resilience when the writing was clearly on the wall? It is because of individual agenda and political motives. These two factors have long been undermining development and has led to the current state of affairs where inequality is the order of the day with people and communities of the global south, especially rural and nature-based being the hardest hit. It is within these hardest hit nature dependent communities that Greenhoff Foundation has been working with for the last decade. They are victims of ecocide, a term that should be on everyone's lips, but unfortunately it remains suppressed to allow for the continued exploitation of our mother earth's natural resources. In June this year, legal experts from across the globe have drawn up a historic definition of ecocide intended to, to be adopted by the International Criminal Court to prosecute the most egregious offenses against the environment. This draft law defines ecocide as, and I quote, unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Ecocide therefore should rightfully be declared as the fifth crime against peace. At the fifth UN Environment Assembly, where Green Hope Foundation once again represented youth voices at multiple forums, a report stated that loss of biodiversity and ecosystem integrity, together with climate change and pollution, will undermine our efforts on 80% of assessed SDG targets, making it even more difficult to report progress on poverty reduction, hunger, health, water, cities, and climate. The COVID-19 virus, a zoonotic disease transmitted from animal to humans, demonstrates the consequences of a finely tuned system of the natural world that has been disrupted. And this has added to the toxic trail of economic growth, pollution and waste, which, is, which results every year in the premature death of millions of people across the world. Lack of clean water, toilets, complete absence of hygiene and sanitation combined with hunger all accumulate to amplify these inequalities. Added to this is the bias of gender that causes women and girls to suffer more. It is these interconnections that our work at Greenhoff Foundation addresses. Our local teams work within these communities, empowering their youth as leaders to drive this progression. The most important aspect of which is establishing behavioral changes. Our route to stopping ecocide is through the creation of local circular bioeconomies that establishes a cyclical regenerative process while building livelihoods and resilience in the local communities. While the SDGs are global goals, the challenges are unique and specific to each region and community. Hence, localization becomes the most important factor that can bring about effective solutions. At Green Hope Foundation, our projects in the 25 countries where we work are all localized to each situation. Our work to combat ecocide ranges from education academies, engaging children from both urban and rural communities, and teaching them about the importance of preserving our ecosystems and helping them rejuvenate their local environment. This environmental education to prevent ecocide 
turns into action on the ground to protect life below water and life on land. It is truly inspiring to see that these children who face so many hardships in their life are so enthusiastic to bring about positive changes, something that we have seen more in countries and regions affected most by these environmental disasters that take away their democratic rights and freedoms. Our chapters from the small island developing state of Kiribati to the Atlantic coastline of Suriname engage in regular cleanups of the coastal areas, including the mangrove ecosystems that play such a crucial role in protecting the coastal communities from climate change induced disasters that once again often infringe on their democratic rights and freedoms. By cleaning up the litter from the nearby tourist spots so that they do not clog the mangrove roots and slowly kill them, we help ensure the longevity of the mangroves and in turn communities they protect. Similarly, we conduct beach cleanups from India to Oman to the UAE, including engaging in special cleanups such as collection of cigarette stubs. One of the prime examples of the blunted ecocide that we have seen firsthand is the destruction of nesting habitats of sea turtles and people collecting these eggs of sea turtles to cook as a delicacy. These flipper prints that you can see on the slides are that of a baby green turtle that we had helped release into the sea. And it is heartbreaking that we as humans could so easily engage in the fifth crime against peace by harming the most innocent of creatures. By cleaning up their nesting habitats, we ensure that the mother turtle is able to lay her eggs safely and that the baby turtles do not face any impediments when going back into the sea that would increase their risk of getting eaten by foxes and other predators, including human beings. Many of the communities that we work in are severely affected by land degradation, in particular their women and girls who lose access to their land rights and tenure security, and in turn whose mobility gets restricted by their loss of stable livelihood and subsequent freedoms. By planting indigenous trees and in particular fruit trees that provide food to all communities and whose roots help hold the soil together to avoid landslides, we help to ensure land degradation neutrality that helps to protect the land and tenure security of vulnerable populations such as women and girls. Our projects continue to scale up and evolve with each passing day, but there's still so much more to do. That is why we need more youth to get involved in meaningful local actions where we, instead of blaming governments, must take responsibility ourselves to stop ecocide, reduce inequalities and build peaceful societies. The world post COVID will not be the same as it was before. The pandemic has affected different people differently depending on the resources they have, the place and the country they live, the job they do and the home they own or dwell in. Responding to such a big crisis with too many limitations was a challenging task. But now we must fight back with stronger measures to achieve the sustainable development goals. The need has arisen for global cooperation and solidarity to alleviate the sufferings of the most vulnerable sections of the population intending to achieve collective good. We must rethink the future of our environment and tackle climate change and environmental degradation with the ambition and urgency. Only then can we protect the health, livelihoods, food security and nutrition of all people and ensure that our new normal is a better one. Let us all commit ourselves to seek a better future for our citizens and nations. We will strive to ensure peace, prosperity, equality, and freedom for human beings and all organisms on Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Anshita, for highlighting Green Hope Foundation's work and for speaking about ecocide. It's really sad that people don't even know about ecocide, let alone speak about it. And that lack of knowledge, as you said, leads to the loss of our democratic rights and freedoms and, of course, destruction of nature as well. So, yes, when we speak about peace, freedom, democracy, that definitely includes the rights of nature, the recognition of how interconnected we as human beings are with our planet, and, of course, uh, you know, stopping ecocide and ensuring that every single person has and organism has access to 
uh, their rights as organisms of this planet. So thank you once again. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite our next panelist, Steve Chu, the Buddha Suchi Foundation's representative to the UN Department of Global Communications. Steve, you have the floor. Hi, Karkachan. Hi, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here with you and excited to be exploring this topic on how we build forward towards uh, peace, freedom, and democracy equally. I think all three of those issues, um, we could spend like a good like hour just on one alone. But for today, I'd love to kind of delve into the conception of peace building, um, how Tsuji works to create more peaceful communities and societies, and maybe at the closing also how we can find peace within ourselves and what we can do within our communities. So I, I, I love that we conceptualize uh, this webinar and this dialogue as building forward because i know traditionally our language within the un talks a lot about building back better right and this notion of building back presumes that what we had before was worth building back towards right and if there's anything that we've spoken to today it's that the stratification of society has been exacerbated even more and that where we were before the pandemic was not really good anyways and so we really want to build towards, right? And in building towards, we have to have that vision of where we want to see ourselves. And I think the role of faith-based organizations and the role of like that really hope in a brighter future comes from our space and particularly as youth. So it's been super inspiring to be with you all and hear all of your reflections in this way. So Tsuji works on uh, all 17 SDGs across a hundred countries around the world. Um, and we do so through volunteer led movements where we try to ensure that those that we are helping are empowered to then come back and serve their community. So as a framework, that's kind of Tsuji's approach. And what we recognize in doing our work, whether it's in disaster relief, providing uh, medical outreaches or uh, building schools for children to ensure that they have education for the future is that no matter where we go, if the SDGs aren't achieved, there is no enabling environment for peace, right? There cannot be this sense of hope hope and tranquility, whether it's in your environment or within yourselves, if you do not see um, where your future lies and if your basic needs aren't being met. And so in order to ensure that our basic human rights are uh, present in all countries that we work, we do a lot of advocacy at the UN um, and at the local level, working with volunteers uh, who have on the ground experience, ensuring that they can champion their own needs, right? So I think in building forward, one of the key ideas that I'd like to share with everyone is how can we work towards empowering our community to advocate for ourselves, right? Oftentimes uh, we see uh, in disaster situations that those who have been impacted conceptualize themselves first and foremost as victims. And that that sentiment of victimhood and helplessness is really present. Um, but if we're able to flip that switch and see that we are still and despite our lack of resources, agents of change capable of mobilizing and building power to address our immediate needs while we wait for help to arrive, we could see that the community becomes a little healthier, a little more flourishing, a little more interconnected, thereby leading to become more resilient for future disasters. In thinking also about um, how we instill and imbue peace within our communities, we live in a very digital age, like Sara was talking about, and one of the trappings of our digital age is the speed of digital communications, right? The amount of news that we are bombarded, whether uh, in developed or developing countries is massive. It's like drinking from a water hydrant, right? And you're not able to process it all. And how we contextualize news can often fall to the side of overwhelm. So one of the things Tsuji does is we have our an entire uh, media culture department that focuses on showcasing and highlighting the good that comes out of the world and contextualizing the news that is coming out of um, all corners of the world to showcase the good that is happening within the bad, right? If we look at the amount of bad things that are happening, whether it's climate change, the continued uh, ravages of the pandemic, there's always something terrible to report on. But how we contextualize that bad um, and how we point to the good, what is happening on the ground, the actions that we can take will in turn shift our mindset and allow for us to uh, take a categorically healthier approach to how we consume our media, how we consume our content. And so it's really about this question of purification of mind, 
right? With building peace within our communities, how do we purify our own minds so that no matter what scenarios and situations we approach, we're able to tackle those issues from a change-making, hope-first narrative. And through that, we're able to then be an anchor for others who are struggling with a same situation to come together, coalesce, and build community, like Saro was mentioning earlier. In thinking about this, it also ties back to um, some of the work that she's doing around mindfulness, right? Um, there's there's a lot of great work happening in our world. We're advocating for tremendous things, but one uh, trapping that we fall in, whether it's youth activists or faith activists in general, is how much do uh, our values and what we advocate for align with our action, right? And are we able to mindfully align ourselves to the things that we preach? Can we walk the talk, so to say? And in doing so, we find that what we advocate for becomes that much stronger, right? Like it's so cool to see Anshita's uh, presentation of everything that she's doing on the ground with Green Hope Foundation, because not only are we advocating for the abolishing of ecocide, we also have this direct experience that is lived and you can like feel it in her passion, right? And so similarly thinking about how we're able to tie our advocacy back to local action. It doesn't have to be big, but so long as we are able to in turn personally take the action, we find the strength of um, what we're able to do even better. Um, I, I think I have like two minutes or three minutes left, but maybe what I want to close in reflection on is thinking about how we see uh, building towards a brighter future, helping to shape this new norm in a uh, ongoing COVID, post-COVID world, right? And I think in trying to create more peaceful societies, it's also really about our relationship with each other and the environment we live in. Can we extract less from the environment, inflict less violence on the world that we live in through our consumption and production habits? Are we able to shift our industrial animal agriculture systems that are currently pillaging the world that we live in in a way that has no regard for long-term impacts towards one that lives in a more symbiotic relationship that recognizes the deep importance that our earth has on also the productivity of our agriculture while also honoring the indigenous and traditional wisdom that has come forth that shows us how to care for the earth while subsisting on the earth. I think also thinking about uh, learning from the pandemic, we've seen so much good work come forth from uh, informal organizing and what comes from mutual aid. And we recognize that we have the money within the local community, right? And we don't need to wait for a big grant to appear in order to do good work to help those who are in need, right? And more so what we find is uh, more pressing is our needs are invisible, right? Peace uh, is a very present thing. If someone's at peace, if they're joyous, you can really see it. But that sentiment of uh, unease and unwellness sometimes can be invisible. Right. So can we as individuals take more time to invest back into our community, ask how people are doing, checking up on them and creating systems to assist individuals, whether in frameworks of mutual aid or just informal assistance. And then finally, I think um, I really hope that uh, through our reflections here and then in thinking about how we build more peace within, we can shift from this hyper-materialistic society that we find ourselves in, where a lot of our problems are stemming from, and really tune into our various faith traditions' voices to lead more spiritual lives, ones that recognize the deep interconnectedness that we have with one another and the world that we live in. I'll close there. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you so much, Steve. And yes, your words are actually really reminiscent of the whole definition of empathy and how important it is that we recognize that interpersonal connection with all of the world challenges and then localize them on the ground. And of course, it's so important that we practice what we preach and walk the talk. And there is a lot of talk that goes on, but sadly, there's still not enough action to complement that. And it's time that you know, the pandemic has taught us it's time for us to take that action and not build back better, but build forward better into a newer and better normal for all. 
So thank you. And, you know, with that, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your uh, views with us uh, today. It's been so inspiring and you've all spoken about your amazing work on peace, freedom and democracy. Uh, I'd just like to inf uh, inform the audience that please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A box. Our panelists will be answering them. Uh, the first question that we do have is that you all have spoken about peace, freedom, and democracy, but there are several uh, nations and even several uh, civil society leaders who speak about how important, uh, well, war and conflict is sometimes in order to achieve peace. So how would you address that? And what would you say to that? So anyone feel free to take the floor? Yes, Steve. I can maybe start and then I, I'd love to hear my co-panelists. I think there's there's a question of time and scale, right? Like I, I think in history, religion has also fallen to the same mentality of like, can we conquer in order to spread our faith, right? And I'm, I'm very happy to see like this new age of uh, faith tradition seems to be a little more tempered in our uh, expansionist desires and rather recognizing the beauty that comes from diversity, right? And so um, I, I would maybe share three thoughts. The first being how much understanding do we have of the other, right? And how much time are we really taking and investing in dialogue to build towards something, right? Is there a shared value? Is there a shared goal that we can uh, arrive at? And oftentimes what we find is there's a shared desire, right? In conflict that comes forth, whether that's uh, resources, uh, the desire for dominance, these narratives, um, that really fuel war, right? The desire for profit, the industrial military complex. But at the same time, I would say that a lot of this um, is short-sighted, right? And the one thing that faith traditions have that I think we offer to this conversation is the beauty of history and time. When we pull the time scale further out and we're able to see beyond um, this direct like 10 year plan to really look at like, what are the hundred years, the thousand year impact that this will come um, from our decision? I think there, there becomes a little more um, weight to our decision whether or not to engage in conflict in order to achieve peace, right? Because conflict uh, to achieve peace, we've seen through history, has always been short-lived and it always brews new conflict because there are winners and losers, right? And in that conceptualization of winning and losing, we end up um, missing the point, right? Like to be at peace with one another is to accept our uniqueness and differences without um, saying that you have something that I lack and I need that and I need to take it away from you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Sara, Anshita, do you have any points? Yes, Sara, sorry, you nod. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, Steve, you brought up a great point, which when you mentioned time and scale, I think, you know, if the question is if war and conflict is required to achieve peace, um, I would approach it from a more of a philosophical angle, right? And you mentioned of like knowledge of the other. Um, but also, I think when we define conflict, right, I think you need to zoom out and acknowledge religion has historically been politicized and politics have historically been used in like faith spaces. And I think that's oftentimes the intersection of faith and politics is when conflict does arise, right? And we have seen examples time and time of faith being enforced and faith also, like when you think of religious freedom, right? Um, spaces in which folks um, are choosing for the right to wear hijab in countries in which it's not allowed. And then you think of spaces in which hijab is enforced and women are fighting the right to not cover. Um, so my thoughts there are, war and conflict for me, it's it's quite subjective, but I, I think one thing that we can't ignore is the fact that faith and philosophical communities have a space in building the culture and social fabric of the communities with whom conflict arises, right? So I think the fact is that we need to look at like religious and spiritual communities as prominent stakeholders in these conversations of dialogue and figuring out how do you bring religion and politics into the space um, and just level the playing field. So I think for me, what that means is normalizing this conversation, right? Normalizing this rhetoric and having it, um, yeah, just removing the polarization of it, which, you know, that's step one, right? And I think just, yeah, going back to the basics of dialogue and like values and being able to listen to the other, because I think we live in an era in which, um, 
it's really, really hard to build that common ground. And I think conversations like these are a first start. So I don't know if I quite have an answer to that, um, but I will say, let's try and normalize things that have become so polarized. Yes, totally. Anshita? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with the unity and diversity phrase. As uh, Steve said, we also need to understand each other from the work we do. And then from the work we do at Greenhouse Foundation, education is really the key to combat this problem. Also, war is never the answer to achieve peace. It is a vicious cycle that will keep on going unless we take action to come out of it. So we need peaceful means to achieve long-term peace. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for your answers. I see that there is a question in the chat, which is how can we get the world to plan more for peace than for war? And how can faith communities complement such strategy? Again, the floor is open to the panelists. Feel free to unmute. You know, yes, Steve. I can. I can start, and then we can cycle through if we want. Um, I, I I love um, thinking about this notion of like how we build culture, right? And I, I think to Sarah's point, like we as faith-based institutions very much are prominent stakeholders in the. Um, I, I don't want to say culture wars because that feels very uh, strange, um, but maybe what I would say is that war and um, peace really seems to stem from this like conception of like scarcity and lack thereof right if we look at the culture wars that are happening within the united states we'll find that a lot of um this polarization comes from uh individuals who feel that they have been marginalized by mainstream culture and they they're pushing back and they they want to lash back towards that right and faith uh is being co-opted as a narrative to um aid in this quote unquote culture war that is occurring in the states um, and so to to the point of how can we get the world to plan more for peace um, rather than for war, I think it does come back to the mandate of what the UN is doing around the sustainable development goals and agenda 2030 in that when people feel that their human rights aren't being need, met, when they feel they're not being respected, there's like a discontent that foments, right? And that brews and that brews and people, uh, bad faith actors, uh, individuals and uh, entities with agendas that want to push the war narrative find that foment to be very easy to uh, brew up, right? If we look at like the Bible Belt within the United States, um, a lot of those communities are fossil fuel communities. They've been there to uh, serve coal mining operations that have been completely stripped bare. And once they've been stripped bare, the uh, coal companies leave that city and that town and that community is left with no resources, no opportunities, no future, right? And so we're seeing a real lot of really good transformative work happening right now within the dr just trans transition community whereby um, nonprofits, businesses, uh, small enterprises are going back into these communities and working hand in hand with these leaders to A, give them new jobs that link to renewable energies, B, provide the training and transitions needed for these individuals to have equitable jobs, and then C, giving them that future and that hope, right? So if we don't take care of individuals who are marginalized, they become the next wave of uh, an actual like ideological battle or the actual uh, war itself. Amazing, thank you, Steve. Uh, Anshita? So uh, one of the main ways that the world can plan for peace is by stopping the funding of mass destruction weapons like um, nuclear weapons and make sure that the money goes towards freedom for all, for combating climate change, for elevating poverty, and that's how we will achieve peace. All faiths, uh, faiths speak about the importance of peace, not war, and it's time that we redirect the money to where it is needed the most for peace and not for war. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I think uh, my, my colleagues have shared some incredible points. The only thing I'm going to continue to add is not only integrating youth voices in positions of power, but like holding our representatives accountable, right? So again, I'm coming at it from like the G20 policy agenda. How do we follow through on the implementation of commitments or policies that are meant to protect um, civil liberty or promote peace building and nation building? Um, so I think for me, the implementation and follow-up is key. 
and continuing to ensure that we are bringing faith and cultural communities into those conversations, right? And they're not considered an afterthought or they're not being tokenized. Um, so when you think of design to implementation. So that's, I think my, my point of view that I'll always continue to push for is um, the beneficiary should be a part of the conversation from the start. Yes, absolutely. Couldn't agree more about that. Thank you very much. And uh, we have two more questions that I'm, I am cognizant of time. So I'll combine the two questions that are there because they're quite similar. The first one's from Robert and says that as a veteran of a terrible war, Vietnam, and a citizen in the country that continues to move into others' lands under the flag of democracy, how will the next generation speak back to this? And uh, the second question that we have is, uh, how are you as panel, as your organizations planning on building forward better and what role do you think interfaith harmony can play? So I think the building forward is common to both of these questions. And again, the floor is open. Um, I'm happy to jump in. So, you know, at a common word among the youth, we recognize the power of young people and shaping communities, right? So another often challenge or frustration I have with the interfaith world is that it often stops at dialogue, right? How do you translate these impactful conversations and help push them into action? So at ACWAY, we are committed to building the capacity of young change makers in a variety of intersectional issues, right? So we're not siloed to the interfaith world. We are working We seem to have lost Sarah. Sarah, are you still with us? Okay, we will come back to Sarah. Hopefully she's able to join us again. Uh, Steve, you have the floor. Sure. Um, and I, Sarah was just getting to the good point, right, of like how she's working on it. Um, so I, I think in, in thinking about colonialism, it's something that's um, very deeply tied to like our educational systems, how we interact with the world. So part of, I think, our role as youth and a large wave and movement has been, how do we unlearn this narrative of colonialism and extraction that we have been given as a birthright? And what do we replace that with? Right. And that that question of exploration has really led us to a lot of uh, narratives around interfaith cooperation, around community building and the importance of respecting the diversity of the various cultures that we find ourselves in and recognizing the intrinsic good that everyone carries within. Um, and so thinking about moving forward, what Siji is doing already, we're very much a grassroots led volunteer based organization. So on the ground, we are working every single day to ensure that the needs of our community is being met so that um, individuals within our community feel at peace and feel imbued with this sentiment of uh, connectedness with one another. And so maybe what I would uh, lift up as a closing idea would be that we, we really need to create enabling environments for peace, freedom, and democracy, and that begins by building community. And so I'd encourage you all to continue to be in community with us um, at Siji. And if you're interested to reach out, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, I'll drop my information in afterwards. But um, recognizing that this advocacy happens both at an international level here at the UN, but then also at a local level. And I think both are important because they inform each other. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, we, sorry, unfortunately, I think dropped off the call. Uh, so, Anshita? Yeah. So, again, I would like to say education and particularly education for sustainable development is so important that and that promotes empathy. That's how we are building forward better. Another thing, and then another thing is that we have firsthand seen how interfaith harmony helps build this resilience in several rural communities that we work in. For example, in Sundarbans, the people of different religions in religions in the villages, they were together in a workshop on Mother Nature because only she can protect them from tiger attacks. Absolutely, that is. Really cool, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for that. And uh, yes, we would have loved to hear a closing remarks from Sarah, but fortunately tech issues. But with that, uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists. And I shall now give the floor to Miriam from the parliament to speak to us about our upcoming virtual parliament. 
Thank you so much, Kakashan, and again to all our panelists and of course all our attendees for joining us in this amazing discussion. Um, I really, I'm really inspired by all of the, the conversation around community. And I think to that point, um, we want to share the word about the 2021 Parliament of the World's Religions, uh, which is happening uh, in October 16th through the 18th, virtually for the first time in our history. Um, I'm actually really excited that we're going to actually be having Green Hope, Tucci Foundation, and Acway doing programming and having networking opportunities for all of our attendees. So I think if you really enjoyed the conversation today, and you want to have a little more time to connect one on one or just kind of listen to the work that these amazing organizations are doing both on the ground through their individual communities and at the large international level, the 2021 Parliament of the World Children is going to be an amazing opportunity to engage. Um, again, being cognizant of the time, I just want to share that if you are a community that wants to engage young people or know of young people who are either interested in the interfaith movement, who are interested or passionate about interreligious understanding, peace and justice, climate action, or the role of women and uh, young people within this community, we do have a really great student rate that they can take advantage of. So I invite you to visit 2021.parliamentofreligions.org um, and learn more about the ways that uh, this parliament will be really intergenerational. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Miriam. and. We actually do have time for one more question before we uh, go move to the concluding remarks. And this is from Guy, who asks, fear and insecurity are the main drivers of military defense buildup. What can we do to reduce these? So very quickly, if our panelists want to answer that. Yes. I, um, I, I was beginning to type a response to Guy in the chat, but uh, I just sent what I needed to send um, in there. I think two things, right? Like fear perpetuates, it's a cycle. And uh, the way we break fear and insecurity is by first recognizing that we are one human family, right? Like I think there's, there's these artificial divisions that are created um, that see us as separate, whether by skin color, religion, um, and all of that stems from this like very primal um, urge, right? But I think if the internet has taught us anything, it's in line with this religious ethos of interconnectedness, right? And so I, I would definitely say that in trying to uh, stave off fear and building up more weapons of mass destruction, we in turn perpetuate fear for others, which is just like this giant arms race um, and it never ends because there's always that next thing, right? And what it requires from us first is to really come together to see ourselves as one. And I think the only structure and framework that we've seen that successfully uh, shifts our mindset in that way has been faith, right? I have not seen another um, process uh, that remotely gets us close to that sort of being able to set aside our differences for a single moment, find shared values and sit together, right? Because oftentimes if we try to do this without the framework of morals and ethical values that faith traditions bring, we bring in colonial narratives of like, I want to help you develop because I'm better than you, right? Like who says that we're better um, as a developed nation than a developing nation when developing nations um, oftentimes have so much wisdom, resources and insights that we we as developed nations are lacking, right? And like vice versa. And I, I think that narrative oftentimes gets um, repeated within the UN framework, right? So why it's so critical to have faith engagement at the UN. And so if you're interested in engaging um, in the UN, I think that definitely bringing the faith voice is present. And then the second piece, thinking about what it means to um, ensure that we as faith leaders are driving the work forward, faith consistent investing, right? We have values as faith-based organizations, how much of our money is tied up in the stock index that is fueling fossil fuels, right? How much of that money is going towards sustainable and renewable energies? And what are we as faith-based leaders not only saying, but putting our money towards, um, I think is always a continuous way to learn and grow. Thank you so much, Steve. Anshita? Yeah, I, I agree with whatever you said. And also, we, as you said, we need to elect leaders who have empathy education, who put people first and not false promises. And as someone who belongs from the nuclear club country, it is sad to see that people are celebrating nuclear weapons testing instead of focusing on stopping the pandemic. We need to educate and we need to communicate and we need to act now. 
there's so much to be done, but there are positive examples and we need to be able to replicate and localize them. So civil society can definitely drive this change. Amazing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. And thank you so much to our uh, panelists. And uh, yes, with that, just like to thank everyone for being with us here today. This has been such a wonderful discussion to commemorate both International Day of Democracy and International Day of Peace. And it is so uh, crucial that we all come together in order to ensure peace, freedom, and democracy for all. And today, as panelists, your strident and passionate voices, it's really this elixir that we need to dispel the inequalities that have plagued us uh, for so long that have played our global order as well. And, you know, history has always uh, borne witness to the fact that it is the youth who have been the harbingers of change because we are fearless. We are not burdened by the cynicism and change is our only constant. And that really shows us that, you know, this generation can bring about the change as well. And we are already doing that or as our panelists have demonstrated. The road ahead is rocky, but it's not insurmountable. And it's imperative that we as young people and as civil society leaders become the glue that brings together nations and regions and really riding above hate and suspicion that vested interests have been exploiting to drive a wedge between people and communities to really create a world that where there's a life of dignity for all and that life of dignity is our common denominator. So with that, thank you once again to our panelists and our audience for this engaging, insightful discussion. And let us pledge to further this momentum so that we can truly and effectively build forward equal for peace, freedom, and democracy. Thank you so much. Please stay safe, take very good care of yourselves and your loved ones, and uh, take care. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Be well. Thanks, everyone. Bye.